William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. Let me call myself, for the present, William Wilson. The fair page now lying before me need not be sullied with my real appellation. This has been already too much an object for the scorn, for the horror, for the detestation of my race. To the uttermost regions of the globe have not the indignant winds brooded its unparalleled infamy? Oh, outcast of all outcasts, most abandoned to the earth, art thou not forever dead? To its honors, to its flowers, to its golden aspirations, and a cloud, dense, dismal, and limitless, does it not hang eternally between thy hopes and heaven? I would not, if I could, here or today embody a record of my later years of unspeakable misery and unpardonable crime. This epoch, these later years, took unto themselves a sudden elevation and turpitude whose origin alone it is my present purpose to assign. Men usually grow base by degrees. From me, in an instant, all virtue dropped bodily as a mantle. From comparatively trivial wickedness I pass, with the stride of a giant, into more than the enormities of an Allah Gabalus. What chance? What one event brought this evil thing to pass? Bear with me while I relate. Death approaches and the shadow which foreruns him has thrown a softening influence over my spirit. I long, in passing through the dim valley, for the sympathy, I had nearly said for the pity, of my fellow men. I would fain have them believe that I have been, in some measure, the slave of circumstances beyond human control. I would wish them to seek out for me in the details I am about to give, some little oasis of fatality amid a wilderness of error. I would have them allow what they cannot refrain from allowing, that, although temptation may have erewhile existed as great, man was never thus, at least, tempted before, certainly, never thus fell. And is it therefore that he has never thus suffered? Have I not indeed been living in a dream? And am I not now dying a victim to the horror and the mystery of the wildest of all sublunary visions? I am the descendant of a race whose imaginative and easily excitable temperament has at all times rendered them remarkable, and in my earliest infancy I gave evidence of having fully inherited the family character. As I advanced in years it was more strongly developed, becoming, for many reasons, a cause of serious disquietude to my friends and of positive injury to myself. I grew self-willed, addicted to the wildest caprices and a prey to the most ungovernable passions, weak-minded and beset with constitutional infirmities akin to my own, my parents could do but little to check the evil propensities which distinguished me. Some feeble and ill-directed efforts resulted in complete failure on their part, and of course in total triumph on mine. Thenceforward my voice was a household law, and at an age when few children have abandoned their leading strings, I was left to the guidance of my own will, and became, in all but name, the master of my own actions. My earliest recollections of a school life are connected with a large, rambling, Elizabethan house in a misty-looking village of England, where were a vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees, and where all the houses were excessively ancient. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-soothing place, that venerable old town. At this moment, in fancy, I feel the refreshing chilliness of its deeply shadowed avenues, inhale the fragrance of its thousand shrubberies, and thrill anew with undefinable delight at the deep hollow note of the church bell, breaking each hour with sullen and sudden roar upon the stillness of the dusky atmosphere in which the fretted Gothic steeple lay embedded and asleep. It gives me, perhaps, as much of pleasure as I can now in any manner experience, to dwell upon minute recollections of the school and its concerns, steeped in misery as I am. Misery, alas, only too real. I shall be pardoned for seeking relief, however slight and temporary, and the weakness of a few rambling details. These, moreover, utterly trivial and even ridiculous in themselves, 
assumed to my fancy, adventitious importance, as connected with a period and a locality when and where I recognized the first ambiguous monitions of the destiny which afterwards so fully overshadowed me. Let me then remember. The house, I have said, was old and irregular. The grounds were extensive, and a high and solid brick wall, topped with a bed of mortar and broken glass, encompassed the whole. This prison-like rampart formed the limit of our domain. Beyond it we saw but thrice a week. Once every Saturday afternoon, when attended by two ushers, we were permitted to take brief walks in a body through some of the neighboring fields, and twice during Sunday, when we were paraded in the same formal manner to the morning and evening service in the one church of the village. Of this church, the principal of our school was pastor. With how deep a spirit of wonder and perplexity was I wont to regard him from our remote pew in the gallery, as with steps solemn and slow he ascended the pulpit. This reverend man, with countenance so demurely benign, with robes so glossy and so clerically flowing, with wigs so minutely powdered, so rigid and so vast, could this be he who of late with sour visage and in snuffy habiliments administered ferule and hand the draconian laws of the academy? O oh, gigantic paradox, too utterly monstrous for solution. At an angle of the ponderous wall frowned a more ponderous gate. It was riveted and studded with iron bolts and surmounted with jagged iron spikes. What impressions of deep awe did it inspire? It was never open save for the three periodical egressions and ingressions already mentioned. Then in every creak of its mighty hinges we found a plenitude of mystery, a world of matter for solemn remark or for more solemn meditation. The extensive enclosure was irregular in form, having many capacious recesses. Of these, three or four of the largest constituted the playground. It was level and covered with fine hard gravel. I well remember it had no trees, nor benches, nor anything similar within it. Of course it was in the rear of the house. In front lay a small parterre, planted with box and other shrubs. But through this sacred division we passed only upon rare occasions indeed, such as a first advent to school or final departure thence. Or perhaps when a parent or friend having called for us, we joyfully took our way home for the Christmas or Midsummer Holy Days. But the house... How quaint an old building was this! To me, how veritably a palace of enchantment! There was really no end to its winding, to its incomprehensible subdivisions. It was difficult at any given time to say with certainty upon which of its two stories one happened to be. From each room to every other there were sure to be found three or four steps, either in ascent or descent. Then the lateral branches were innumerable, inconceivable, and so returning in upon themselves that our most exact ideas in regard to the whole mansion were not very far different from those with which we pondered upon infinity. During the five years of my residence here, I was never able to ascertain with precision in what remote locality lay the little sleeping apartment assigned to myself and some eighteen or twenty other scholars. The schoolroom was the largest in the house. I could not help thinking, in the world. It was very long, narrow, and dismally low, with pointed Gothic windows and a ceiling of oak. In a remote and terror-inspiring angle was a square enclosure of eight or ten feet, comprising the sanctum during hours of our principal, the Reverend Dr. Bransby. It was a solid structure, with massy door, sooner than open, which in the absence of the Dominic, we would all have willingly perished by the pain forte et dure. In other angles were two other similar boxes, far less reverence indeed, but still greatly matters of awe. One of these was the pulpit of the classical usher, one of the English and mathematical. Interspersed about the room, crossing and recrossing in English irregularity, were innumerable benches and desks, black, ancient, and time-worn piled desperately with much bethumbed books, and so beseamed with initial letters, names at full length, grotesque figures, and other multiplied efforts of the knife as to have entirely lost what little of original form might have been their portion in days long departed. A huge bucket with water stood at one extremity of the room, and a clock of stupendous dimensions at the other. Encompassed by the massy walls of this venerable academy, 
I pass, yet not in tedium or disgust, the years of the third lustrum of my life. The teeming brain of childhood requires no external world of incident to occupy or amuse it, and the apparently dismal monotony of school was replete with more intense excitement than my riper youth has derived from luxury, or my manhood from crime. Yet I must believe that my first mental development had in it much of the uncommon, even much of the outré. Upon mankind at large, the events of very early existence rarely leave in mature age any definite impression. All is gray shadow, a weak and irregular resemblance, an indistinct regathering of feeble pleasures and phantasmagoric pains. With me, this is not so. In childhood, I must have felt with the energy of a man what I now find stamped upon memory in lines as vivid, as deep, and as durable as the exergs of the Carthaginian metals. Yet in fact, in the fact of the world's view, how little was there to remember. The morning's awakening, the nightly summons to bed, the connings, the recitations, the periodical half-holidays and perambulations, the playground with its broils, its pastimes, its intrigues, these by a mental sorcery long forgotten were made to involve a wilderness of sensation, a world of rich incident, a universe of varied emotion, of excitement of the most passionate and spirit-stirring. Où le bon temps coûte si de faire. In truth, the ardor, the enthusiasm, and the imperiousness of my disposition soon rendered me a marked character among my schoolmates and by slow but natural gradations gave me an ascendancy over all not greatly older than myself, over all with a single exception. This exception was found in the person of a scholar, who, although no relation, bore the same Christian and surname as myself, a circumstance, in fact, little remarkable, for notwithstanding a noble descent, mine was one of those everyday appellations which seem by prescriptive right to have been time out of mind the common property of the mob. In this narrative, I have therefore designated myself as William Wilson, a fictitious title not very dissimilar to the real. My namesake alone, of those who in school phraseology constituted our set, presumed to compete with me in the studies of the class and the sports and broils of the playground, to refuse implicit belief in my assertions and submission to my will. Indeed, to interfere with my arbitrary dictation in any respect whatsoever. If there is on earth a supreme and unqualified despotism, it is a despotism of a master mind in boyhood over the less energetic spirits of its companions. 